What's up everybody? My name is Scott Plant. Today I am heading out to Rochester, New Hampshire to meet with the Fifield family to see if I can offer some healing through music. Um, the Fifield family lost their, their son, their brother, uh, to a heroin overdose. And my goal for today is to try to be a vessel for God to allow them to heal, to have an opportunity to share um, Shane's story and uh, express to me, you know, everything that went along with that so as that I can then take it in and try to translate it over to music um, and give them something to honor their loved one with. What's up, bro? What's going on, man? How you doing? Good, yourself? Hey, man. Hi, guys. How you doing? How you doing short stuff? <laughs> I learned a long time ago that each of us is given something in this life. No matter what it is, I mean some people come into money and some people come into artistic gifts, some people come in with you know mental gifts to be able to do great jobs and beautiful things and I've learned in my lifetime that if you are given something you should pay it forward and doing this for families um, is my way of paying it forward by taking what God gave to me um, and allowing me to share it with people you know is that so we kind of all share in the the ability and the gift remember today the cameras don't matter you know if in the end you guys are uncomfortable with this whatsoever, we throw all this away, I don't care. I'm literally here for you because I want to help you guys to be able to heal, you know, from this. And uh, from working with a lot of different families, you know, I know what that process is like and how much pain you guys have to bear. You know, that's something that kind of sticks with you for the rest of your life. So sure. I'm just trying to, to help you on that journey. That's what I'm here for. I'm Seth. Um, I'm Shane's older brother. Um, he was my absolute best friend in all senses of the word. Um, almost a brother second. He uh, was there for me for anything. Didn't matter. Never gave up right or wrong. So I'm Adam. I'm Shane's youngest brother. Uh, he was around for most of my childhood. He wasn't always around. I couldn't like always see him every day. But most of the time he was, he used to come to my sports events a lot. He liked seeing that stuff. I like seeing him a lot. But I, I could definitely tell he liked to go see his daughter a lot too. Okay. So he had a child. Yeah, that so was probably the most important part of his life, honestly. Okay. I'm Matthew Roy. I'm uh, Shane's first little brother. I knew he was a brother, that's for sure. But he was around, and he was pretty nice when he was around. I missed him a lot when he wasn't. I'm Kristen, I'm Shane's mom. Um, Shane is my second <laughs> son out of my four. Um, I don't know how to describe Shane, but he was Shane. <laughs> he was loyal. Mm -hmm. um, loved his family, loved his daughter. Um, he was funny. Had his own uh, unique sense of humor. Uh, <laughs> And we still carry on with that sense of humor as much can, as we can. I can see that by the stick <laughs> yeah. in the back. Yes, we will you know, bring Shane out. <laughs> Shane's in all our pictures, so we keep him around. I'm Mike. I'm Kristen's boyfriend. Um, known Shane for probably ten years. Ten years. Okay, ten years, I guess. Um, yeah, I was going to say like 10 or 12, but yeah. he worked for me on occasion, and um, he was funny. He was a pain in the ass. <laughs> True. Uh, there was a lot of different emotions that went along with Shane at times, but he, you know, tried hard and was a good kid. I'm also a person in long-term recovery. I've been sober for nearly three years, so working with families that have lost loved ones to addiction, to the disease of addiction, um, is something that I feel pretty passionate about um, because I see the effects um, that addiction is having on society as a whole. 
I see the, the trauma it's causing, you know, even being a part of the recovery community, um, every single day almost, I, I feel like, you know, I go through my Facebook feed and somebody else has passed from it. It's a daily thing and it's, it's something we really need to shed light to. I want you guys to start off, and I don't care if these are funny stories, if they're sad stories, if they're cool stories, just what stories do you guys have? Like, because I'm trying to get a sense, a better sense of who Shane was as a person, because not only do I want to be able to write something that is going to allow you guys to express yourselves through music, but I also want to try to channel Shane's spirit into it. So the Shane, the, the song can become Shane's song too, you know? Shane likes rap music. You like rap music? Not all the time. Not all the time. <laughs> you did like rock for a little yeah. while, and then I kind of just like drifted right into rap, and he was like, oh, I don't like rock, I don't like this music. I don't know why. Okay, well during yeah. that little phase that he had where he liked rock music, what did he like? Heavy. For my Valentine. Heavy? Bullet for my Valentine? Okay, that's Take good. Take him to his concert. Yeah. Alright. <laughs> Anything heavy. Bridge. All yeah. of it. Bridge, okay. It. Good heavy. I like yeah. that kind of heavy. Yeah. Excellent. Yeah, he was just like... Yeah, it was what he would call soft. <laughs> <laughs> the night he passed, he came into the room and said um, he wanted to take me, Matthew, and Adam to a concert. And he didn't care which one it was. <laughs> and then I said, you know... I told him that we would talk in the morning. What did Shane seem to struggle with that, you know, caused him to to I think one down that thing path? that did not help him is that he wasn't allowed to see his daughter. Okay. That was a major factor. Alright. He also didn't like getting help. He wanted to do it on his own. Yeah. He didn't really look for outside help. It was more of like if he needed someone to lean on, he would come to us. Other than that, he would try and like get it done himself. That is, unfortunately, that's a part of the battle, a part of the struggle is, you know, you, you kind of hit rock bottom sometimes, and that's when you, you, you're a little bit more receptive to help and seeking other things, but then it's, there's a lot of hard work that follows. And, and sometimes when he was like, looking for help in the beginning, there wasn't much in this area. Yeah. I still don't feel there's enough in this area. No, there's definitely not. But he never seem to realize he was a bright kid within himself. That's why it's so important for people in recovery to create these new habits and these things and build life because it does, it builds confidence because I've been listening to people speak in recovery centers and meetings for literally, I don't know, last 15 years of my life because that's how long it took me to get it right. Um, and each and every person that I usually hear speak talks about the fact that during those times they wanted to be anybody but themselves. You know, it's like they're missing something inside and it's yes. it's not something that you can really pull from outside things. You know, it's things that you gotta find within yourself to build mm -hmm. your confidence and it's important to have a community around you, which is why it's so important to make the recovery community bigger in New Hampshire because what it's doing is it's, it's helping these people connect and it's helping them fill that thing yes. and build up their confidence to say, you know, you're worthy and you are capable of this. And that little bit of confidence can go a really long way with somebody who's struggling. So. Now, I want to talk about this too, and this is probably the most touchy one, but it's, you know, the day that he passed, like, um, that experience for you guys. On the 25th, she was, uh, he came home from work and, and uh, I could tell he was on something, but I know he hadn't done anything here. Yep. Just the way he was talking, and the energy that he kind of had, the silliness yep. that he had, I, I just knew. Came out the door and I'm like, someone's in the bathroom. The water's running. Is he in the shower? And I came out, looked at me, I'm like, okay, Shane's not on the couch. And I'm like, why is he showering at this time? And I walked back to the bedroom and I said something to Mike about Shane being in the bathroom. 
Because we've had this conversation many times about Shane being in the bathroom. But it was just like, it was weird. I'm standing there and I said, you know, that's not the shower. That's the sink. The sink is running. So I like went to the door, knocked on the door, and I'm like Shane, there's nothing. Did it again louder, like Shane, and nothing. And the third time, I'm I'm on that door. Before I even got out of bed, I knew I'm like motherfucker. So I went over there, and I didn't just knock on the door. I was pounding on the door to nothing. And I looked at her, I said. Get me a fucking shoe, and I booted in the door. And uh, he was in the fetal position. I'm like, go get the Narcan. And I Narcan him twice, and it's like, whoa. Drag him out, and the whole time she's standing there, and I'm yelling at her what to do. Call 911, go do the... And it, it was just, it was rough. He was laying there, and he almost had a smile on his face, and his feet were crossed. Like he was at peace. And I knew then that he was gone. Even if they got a heartbeat, I knew he was gone. And I just, I knew too much time had passed. There was no way that if he actually pulled through, that, that he would be the same. And then uh, one of the paramedics finally said, we have a heartbeat. And then they move fast. So I'm sitting there in the hospital and the doctor finally comes out and he says that they didn't find anything on the CAT scan. And I said, I know. And I said, I, I have to call Seth. I have to get a hold of Seth. I said, but I gotta call the prison first because there needs to be people in place for him. Because it was not gonna go good. In the prison, they have a count from noon time to one. And during that time, the whole facility is on lockdown. You don't come out, and that's what it is. But during that time, they called my name and said, I need to go down to the office. I needed to go do whatever. I don't know. Yeah. So they popped the door, and I went down. And I sat down, and it just struck me as strange. I'm more worried about what you know, what the hell they do wrong. I'm about to go home in three days. What are you talking about? You know, I know I didn't do anything. Like, I've been on my best behavior on purpose. You know, driving just to go home. And then uh, the counselor said, "Listen, you need to go home. Something's happened." And like, just don't ever think of that. At at 25 years old, you don't think that somebody's gonna pass away, you know? Mm -hmm. I could tell like something wasn't right because mm -hmm. he overdosed before and I saw him, I don't know how long after, but I was told to stay upstairs and like after everything happened, everyone left, he came downstairs and he was just sitting on the floor by himself. And I, I think he was like really thinking over like what happened. And I was thinking that was just gonna happen again when I first saw him, I was like, everything's gonna be okay. It's gonna be okay. Everything's fine. It was very important for me to be there when they um, did the test. I, I don't know if anybody else was in the room had ever heard me say it, but the doctors did. I said, I, I know he's gone, but I was there when he was born and I have time, the time when he was born. And I will be here to have his time to death and I won't leave him. And I will not leave him for that test. It was time for the test. It, they said for eight minutes we have to take him off and see if there is an attempt to breathe, attempt to move. And I held his hand the whole time. And there was, there was nothing. There was no attempt to anything. And, and then at 149, 150, maybe. They cleared the brain dead. The day finally came where they did a test to see if any any brain activity and he didn't. So once I heard that, I kind of it kind of broke my heart a little bit. I knew he was gone completely, and I wouldn't be able to get him back. I went from the parking lot of the prison straight to the hospital, 
and um, I met my mom in the parking garage and we just hugged each other and together we just went straight to my brother. I didn't want to see really anybody else. I didn't want to deal with anything else. I just wanted to see my brother, you know. I knew it was going to be bad. I don't know if I knew it was going to be that bad, you know. Never ready. Never ready. Um, you're my best friend, man, you know. So I walk in and I see him. And I think for probably like the next 15 minutes, I don't think I moved from my brother, you know what I mean? I just held him. That was, that was the hardest, hardest time ever, man, you know. Yeah. Just hanging on because at that moment he was on life support. And I, we were all told, and that's probably the hardest thing, we were, we were told that that night, at around 6 o'clock, they were going to take him. So you, you just hold on to every minute, every second, just holding on to that little bit of life, still knowing that it may have been a machine, but he was there. And in that moment, I just had my family. I just had the people that mattered most. But he was still there. He did bring us all together. I said that. Is there a possibility of organ donation because something good has to come out of this? And if he can save somebody else? And... So that's what we did. Because they intubated him, they could not call him dead at Frisbee or anywhere else. They had to prove he was brain dead before they could unintubate him. Okay. So what happened was me and Kristen had to talk to specialists and everything else and organ donation and say everything about the kids past that she could remember or, or whatever to see what could be donated. But the, the thing is, because they intubated him here, he was able to be an organ donor. And now we had to bring him to the elevator because he's an organ donor. So he gave away his heart. Uh, I'm pretty sure both kidneys. Yes. And, uh, you know, that time came and, like Adam had mentioned, we brought him to the elevator. And those doors closed. And then reopened. My brother wasn't there anymore. You know, he was giving somebody else life. He was paying it forward. He was giving it to the next guy. He was, he was giving life to four more people by giving his own. And we met the guy who got his heart. David? Yeah. Did really? Yeah. Oh my God. That's... Came to Matthew's graduation. Party. Beautiful. Working with the Five Field family today was a beautiful experience. Um, out of all the families that I've worked with, they were probably the most uh, expressive. You know, sometimes I have to kind of continually ask questions to kind of pull certain things out of people because I think it's a difficult process to talk about these things. Um, but the Five Field family, they were incredibly receptive incredibly open with me and I think that all around it was an amazing therapy for the entire family um, and I think you know I succeeded today I was able to do what I set out to do this is my idea for this I want to actually do two completely separate songs so this one I'm going to share with you guys tonight I think it's more for you guys right but I have this feeling that I should do an uh, in-studio song that's very different and a lot more rock-driven to be Shane's song. So this song is for you guys. I 
did my best to keep you from falling into darkness in your head. But now I pray that you get to fly and know what I for. You'll be by my side all the way down to your very last breath. You were my all, my best friend It killed me to watch you drift away to nothing else And now I hope that you found peace In everything else you couldn't find Take my breath so I can give you life. I'd sacrifice everything I can to give you time. I would have gave it, but it's my pride to keep me from fighting through the story of my life. But now I pray. Oh, Thank you, brother. I believe that the only way for us to truly fix this is to fix the root, the root, the problem, the internal issues that are causing people to use to begin with. And if we offer our love and healing to the people who are suffering internally, which is causing them to have this response to you know, self-medicate or fill this void or whatever it may be. I think if we go to the root of the problem, stop trying to fix it way out here. Stop trying to fix it with a legal system. Stop trying to fix it, you know, far down the road in these all these physical matters. Let's fix it from the root of the problem.